Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining me for today's webinar. Uh, while I've been running these construction webinars for a number of years now, this is the first one which I've done remotely. Uh, and it seems very strange to be sitting in here in a room by myself rather than surrounded by you all in person uh, eating our bacon sandwiches. Um, I'm sure that many of you used to come just for the breakfast, so it's uh, quite reassuring to know that some of you have come for the talk as well. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Rowan Turrell, and I'm the partner and head of dispute resolution here at Boys Turner. And I returned to work from a year's maternity leave at the end of September. And little did I know when I left in the heat of last summer, quite what 2020 would have in store for all of us. Um, but the courts have managed to keep on going and have carried on handing down cases in spite of the current situation. And today I'm going to have a look through six of those cases and extract some of the key points, uh, which I hope will provide you with some learning guides for things to avoid to help you get into disputes, into the, help avoid you getting dis into disputes in the future. And the cases that I'm going to be looking at today are Milchrist Developments and Waters, Rochford Construction and Kilham, RGB Plastering and Tor Dry Lining, SNS Storage Solution, Storage Equipment and Warehouse, uh, Fresco and Lonsdale, and John Doyle and Erith. Um, so there will be the opportunity to ask some questions at the end. Uh, if you could please use the Q&A panel um, and then when I stop sharing my screen at the end I'll be able to have a look at those for you and hopefully answer them at the end. So looking at the first case um, this is Milchrist and Waters uh, and this will be hopefully my only very brief mention of Covid today uh, which is in the context of adjudication. This was a case which came before the court in early April 2020 very shortly after the first lockdown began. And the background facts aren't particularly exceptional. Miss Waters started an adjudication against Milchrist on the 23rd of March 2020, claiming about £45,000 in respect of a final account dispute. The adjudicator was appointed and he set out his timetable. Um, and Milchrist's solicitor responded, indicating that they couldn't meet the timetable because there was a national crisis and they required Miss Waters to withdraw her reference to adjudication on the basis that it would be a breach of natural justice. In response, the adjudicator suggested that there be a two week extension to the timetable, which Miss Waters agreed, but Milchrist didn't. Milchrist's solicitor replied that he could not even consider an extension of any less than three months, but even that. Milchrist's position was effectively that the adjudication couldn't proceed at all until the COVID crisis was over. Rather than using the time that it had, and getting on with the adjudication, Milchrist went off to the High Court for an injunction restraining the adjudication from continuing. Now, there were some genuine issues which affected their ability to respond to the adjudication. For example, their solicitor was largely self-isolating for personal reasons, which the judge didn't criticise. And there were also some papers which were with the client rather than with the solicitor, um, which needed to be reviewed. But the judge didn't see why these couldn't be transported to the solicitor or scanned or otherwise dealt with somehow remotely. There were also some non-COVID related issues, such as tracking down a witness and the solicitor's workload, but neither of these were seen by the judge as being exceptional. And lastly, the adjudicator wanted to conduct a site visit. Milkers wanted to attend and have its own representative and its own surveyor in attendance. The judge concluded that there was no right for the parties to be in attendance at a site visit though. There was also no right for other surveyors to be present. He said that the adjudicator could consider recording matters and seeking the party's assistance in other ways if that was required. So in conclusion, there were no exceptional circumstances here that meant an adjudication should be granted. The adjudicator had indicated he was willing to offer an extension and that appears to have been sufficient to satisfy the court that the principles of natural justice would not be breached. So the moral of this story is that adjudication is quick, rough and ready process and even COVID will not be used as an excuse for not getting your ducks in a row. So moving on to our next case, this is the case of Rochford Construction and Kilham. Before getting into the facts, just as a reminder, under the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act, uh, which I refer to as the Construction Act, uh, contracts have to provide an adequate mechanism to determine what payments are due and when, and what the final date for payment is. If those mechanisms are missing from your contract, then the relevant terms will be implied by the scheme for construction contracts. This could mean that the timings of the various steps of the interim payment cycle, such as the timing of the issue of payment notices and pay less notices, are not when the parties anticipated that they would be. The payment cycle often ends up being shorter than the parties envisaged it would be, and that can mean that pay less notices can be missed, resulting in smash and grab adjudications. 
In this case, the subcontract stated as follows. Application date, end of month. Valuations monthly as per attached payment schedule, end of month. Payment terms, 30 days from invoice as per attached payment schedule. SE payment cert must be issued with invoice. However, there was no payment schedule. And the first issue therefore was what was meant by the phrase end of month and when did it run from if there was no payment schedule telling you what the dates were supposed to be? Did this provide an adequate mechanism in spite of the missing payment schedule? The, con sub the contractor argued that the subcontractor complied with the Construction Act and so there was no need to fall back on the provisions of the scheme. But the judge refused to accept the contractor's submission that end of month meant the last day of calendar month. There were other possible interpretations. For example, it could mean that the date of the relevant period to which the application related. There were also practical difficulties if this is what the wording meant. What if the last day of the month wasn't a business day? Was it really feasible for the subcontractor to compile an application for an entire month on the last day of the month, including work done on that day and submit it the same day? The payment schedule that was supposed to have been attached may have made the provision workable, but without it, the judge found that it was an impractical and unworkable solution. And as a result, she found that the parties hadn't agreed a due date as required by the Act, and so the scheme applied. The judge also found that there was no final date for payment, and so the scheme also applied in this respect. However, she went on to make some interesting over to comments on whether a final date for payment could have been linked to an invoice being rendered. As these comments were obiter, they're not binding, but they're worth bearing in mind. What she said was that while a due date can be fixed by reference to an invoice or a notice, the final date for payment has to be pegged to the due date and be a set period of time and not an event or a mechanism. So what are the lessons to be learned from this case? Now, the first one is stated in the obvious, but it's amazing how many times it gets overlooked and how many times I see this happening. If you refer to a payment schedule in your contract, then make sure that you include one. This dispute is unlikely to, to have arisen if the parties had included the schedule referred to because they would have had specified dates that they should have been making the applications by. Secondly, avoid ambiguity around the timings of when payments are due. If there are various different ways in which a clause can be interpreted, it's going to cause you problems. And lastly, be wary of making the final date for payment referable to submission of an invoice rather than a certain number of days after the due date. As I mentioned, the judge's comments around this point were obiter, but they might well be followed by a judge or adjudicator subsequently, and you don't wish to be the one finding yourself falling foul. If you're not careful around your wording, you may inadvertently allow the scheme rules to apply with unintended consequences for the time of the interim payment cycle. So the next case is RGB plastering and tall dry lining and plastering. And in this case, the contractor sought a declaration from the court that an application for payment by the subcontractor was invalid as it did not comply with the requirements for notices set out in the subcontract. In abbreviated terms, the subcontract included terms to the following effect. That the applications for payment would reflect the sums due on the interim application date referred to in the payment schedule. Uh, unfortunately, actually, in this case, there was a payment schedule, so we didn't have to deal with that issue this time. If the application was submitted after the relevant date, it would not be considered. And lastly, and importantly, applications had to be submitted to a specified email address. Now, the payment schedule set out a list of the relevant dates. And for the April 2019 cycle, the relevant dates were the 28th of April and the 3rd of May. The subcontractor emailed the application to various RGB employees on the 7th of May, but not to the address specified in the subcontract. And it also stated that the works were valued up to the 30th of April 2019. So neither the 30th of April or the 7th of May dates match the dates in the payment schedule. There have been various cases in recent years in which have resulted in the principle that an interim payment application must be clear in substance, form and intent. The recipient probably has to, properly has to appreciate the consequences of the document and the need to respond to it, and it must be unambiguous. Here, the judge found that the timing of the application did not match the payment schedule. And although the subcontractor tried to argue it was an early application for the May-June cycle, the judge said that a reasonable recipient might think that with a 30th of April 2019 valuation date, it was actually a late application for the April payment cycle, and it was also sent to the wrong email address. The judge therefore concluded in this case that the application did not comply with the subcontract requirements. It was not clear on an ambiguous 
so that the parties could know what to do about it or when. It was therefore found to be invalid. So what are the lessons to be learned from this case? If your contract includes provisions regarding the mechanics of submitting interim payment applications, make sure you follow them to the letter. Ensure you have a process in place so that you know precisely when applications need to be submitted, what date the works are to be valued up to, and whether there are any special processes that need to be followed in terms of who the application is to be submitted to and how. Failure to do so could result in you missing out on an interim payment cycle, and that could well have adverse impact on your cash flow. So the next case is SNS storage equipment installations, and I'm only going to touch on it very briefly as it's a county court decision. Um, but I've put it in because it's a useful reminder uh, to make sure that you consider whether or not the Construction Act is likely to apply to your contract. If it does, and you've not included your payment terms, then as I've mentioned, then these will be implied into your contract pursuant to the scheme for construction contracts. And this may mean that you end up with a payment process, which you're not expecting if you thought in fact that the Act didn't apply at all. And it will also include a right for the parties to submit disputes to adjudication. And again, if you thought that the Construction Act didn't apply and it actually does, then that might come as a surprise to you. In most cases, it's going to be very obvious that a contract is a construction contract within the meaning of the Act. But here, though, the contract was for the installation of warehouse racking in an already occupied warehouse. This was a very substantial racking system, which is going to take some three months to install at a cost of over £120,000, so not just a few shelves. The claimant installation company referred to dispute over payments to adjudication. The adjudication was successful and the claimant sought summary judgments to enforce the decision following non-payment. Um, I'm just going to pause there um, because some of you may be unaware of what happens after an adjudicated decision is made if it's not paid. And the Technology and Construction Court has an expedited process to enforce a decision by what way of what is known as a summary judgment application. And that usually allows the matter to be addressed by a judge within a matter of weeks rather than days. Uh, and I'm just mentioning it here because it crops up in several of the cases I'm going to come on to. And if you've not come across a summary judgment application, you might be wondering what it is that I'm talking about. So back to this application, one of the grounds on which enforcement of the decision was resisted was that the Construction Act did not apply to the contract. And so there was no right to adjudicate. If there was no right to adjudicate, then the adjudicator's decision couldn't be enforced. So for the Act to apply, there needs to be a construction contract firstly, and that requires an agreement for the carrying out of construction operations. Now the Act includes a very long list of what amounts to construction operations, some of which might not be immediately obvious as being part of a construction contract and sometimes can catch people unawares. The relevant sections being considered here in abbreviated form were construction of structures forming part of the land, whether permanent or not, and installation in any building of fittings forming part of the land. And then there's a list of things which are included within that definition. The issue here was whether the racking formed part of the land. In essence, the judge said that the question of whether a particular system such as this would form part of the land and so be part of a construction operation was a matter of fact and degree. In this particular case, he took into account various factors including the fact that this was a very substantial system and the warehouse could not perform its function without it. The racking was substantially incorporated in the warehouse by its attachment to the building structure. And when stepping back and looking at the overall picture, he found that this was a case in which the racking did form part of the land and therefore the act applied. This meant that the adjudicator did have jurisdiction to determine the dispute. So my advice from this case is if you're ending, entering into a contract which may only seem to be peripherally involved in construction, do check the definition of construction operations in the Act to see if it's likely to apply. And if you're in a potentially grey area such as this, you might want to consider including Act compliant payment provisions in any event to avoid any argument later on and to prevent the unwitting incorporation of unexpected terms. As this was a question of fact and degree, another judge in a similar scenario may well reach a different conclusion. So it's not a given that installation of racking is always going to fall within the Construction Act, um, but this is something to be aware of and watch out for. So my next case is one of the big, biggest construction cases that hit the court this year, uh, and that's the case of Bresco Electrical Services and Michael J. Lonsdale. Uh, this was a Supreme Court decision, uh, and it's bubbling away um, since it was first heard by the High Court in July 2018. Uh, it moved to the Court of Appeal in 2019, 
and it finally made its way to the Supreme Court in June of this year. And the case looks at the issue of adjudications involving insolvent parties and the potential incompatibility between the insolvency regime and the adjudication regime. I'm not going to go into the minute detail from the insolvency perspective, but rather look at the practical implications of the case for those of you who might be being chased for payment by a liquidator so you can understand what your position might be. So by way of background, Bresco and Lonsdale were both electrical contractors. And on this project, Bresco was engaged under a sub-sub contract to undertake electrical works for Lonsdale at a site in St. James's Square in London. In December 2014, Bresco left the site and later on it alleged that it had done so because of a repudiatory breach by Lonsdale. It then went into creditors voluntary liquidation in March 2015. In late 2017, there were exchanges of correspondence between the parties, with both accusing the other of being in repudiatory breach of contract. Lonsdale claimed it was entitled to about £325,000 for getting Bresco's work to finish by another contractor. Bresco claimed that it was entitled to payment for the work it had completed and damages for breach of contract of just over £200,000. Each side denied the other side's claim, and in June 2018, Bresco started an adjudication. Lonsdale asserted that the adjudicator did not have any jurisdiction to deal with the dispute for reasons which I will come on to. And what it did was it issued proceedings seeking a declaration that the adjudicator did not have jurisdiction, and it sought an injunction restraining the adjudication from continuing. So rather than waiting until the decision had been made, it tried to stop the adjudication in its tracks. So what was the problem here and why did Lonsdale think that the adjudicator lacked jurisdiction? Well, the crux of the issue stems from the set-off provisions in the insolvency rules. And in very simple terms, these provide that if there are cross claims between a company in liquidation and one of its creditors, then these are set off against each other. If that set off results in the company in liquidation being owed money, then it's paid by the creditor to the liquidator. If the creditor is owed money, then they prove in the liquidation for the balance of the money which is owing to them. The right to adjudicate is a statutory right under the, construction under the Construction Act, and it's in relation to any dispute arising under the construction contract. What Lonsdale argued was that the effect of Bresco's liquidation was to turn the claim and the cross-claim under the contract into a single claim for the net balance under the set-off provisions, whichever way that happened to fall. They said that that claim for the net balance was not a claim arising under the construction contract, but was a dispute under the insolvency provisions. They therefore contended that the Construction Act provisions in relation to adjudication did not apply and the adjudicator lacked jurisdiction. So the question was whether the application of the insolvency set-off rules meant that the claims and the cross-claims under the contract ceased to exist. Should the court then restrain a company in insolvent liquidation from pursuing an adjudication where there was a cross-claim? This was therefore a battle between two statutory provisions. On the one hand, we had section 108 of the Construction Act dealing with adjudication. And on the other hand, rule 4.25 of the insolvency rules setting out the provisions for set off, where there's claim and a cross claim. Now, I'm not going to go into the procedural background in any great detail, um, but it's, different, it's interesting to note that there was a different approach taken at each stage of the proceedings. Um, and the reason that I find that particularly interesting is clients often say to me, which way is this case going to go? What's the outcome going to be? Uh, and this particular case shows that with any question, even the greatest judicial minds in the country can approach it in different ways. We had three levels of the court system coming up with three different ways of answering the question in different ways. Uh, and it just goes to show that you can't guarantee what the particular outcome to any question may be. So in the High Court, the judge decided that the adjudicator did lack jurisdiction altogether. He therefore granted the injunction. In the Court of Appeal, the Court of Appeal judges disagreed with the High Court in relation to the adjudicator's jurisdiction. They decided he did have jurisdiction, but as his decision would not be enforced because of Bresco's insolvency, the adjudication process was an exercise in futility and a waste of time of money. The Court of Appeal therefore continued the injunction. In the Supreme Court, it was common ground that if there had not been a cross-claim, the adjudicator would have had jurisdiction to deal with the dispute, even though Bresco was in liquidation. The issue arose because of those cross-claims triggering the insolvency set-off provision. 
However, the Supreme Court decided that the set-off provisions did not mean that the underlying disputes under the construction contract melted away. The adjudicator still had jurisdiction, even though a cross-claim arose. The Supreme Court therefore found that the adjudication regime under the Construction Act was not incompatible with the insolvency set-off provisions. The existence of the cross-claims did not prevent a party from submitting a dispute to adjudication. As I mentioned, the Court of Appeal concluded that even though an adjudicator might have jurisdiction to determine such a dispute, there was no point in him doing so. They therefore continued to restrain the adjudication. But here the Supreme Court differed in its approach. They highlighted that it was wrong to suggest that the only purpose of adjudication was the protection of cash flow by means of enforcing interim payment obligations. It was also wrong, they felt, to interfere with the statutory right to adjudicate by allowing injunctive relief to stop the adjudication, except in exceptional circumstances. So what the Supreme Court did, instead of allowing the injunctive relief, was to say that what should happen is that the court should address any issues which may arise at the enforcement stage. So basically the adjudication would continue, the decision would be given, if it was going to be enforced, then the court would look at it at that stage. Now, fortunately, at more or less the same time, there was a subsequent case going through the court, which allowed the court to look at how this might work in practice. And that's the case that I'm going to come on to next. So this was John Doyle Construction and Erith Contractors. The Bresco judgment was handed down by the Supreme Court on 17th of June this year. And coincidentally, the John Doyle case was actually listed to be heard on the same day. Um, but it was postponed so that the Bresco decision could be given and the parties have time to uh, consider it so that it could be applied by the court to this case. Now, by way of background, this was a case that stemmed from the uh, landscape works for the Olympic Park. Uh, and you might think, well, that was quite a, li a long time ago. It's taken a while to get to court and you would be right. JDC carried out hard landscaping works at the Olympic Park. And unfortunately, it didn't survive long enough to see the opening ceremony as it entered into administration in June 2012 and then into creditors' voluntary liquidation in June 2013. It wasn't until January, January 2018 that they started an adjudication and at that time they were seeking the recovery of some £4 million. Pounds. It went in their favour and eventually they were awarded about £1.2 million. Pounds. It was not until several years later in April 2020 that it took the step of seeking enforcement of that decision by way of the summary judgment process in court. Now, I should just mention in passing here that there was an issue in the case about the assignment of the claims against Erith by the liquidators of JDC. Uh, I'm not going to go into that uh, today, um, but just mention it in passing in case that's something that might be of interest to you. Now, the issues which the court had to address here were as follows. In what circumstances will a company in liquidation be entitled to summary judgment on a valid adjudicator's decision in its favour? Were those circumstances present here? And if the court did allow summary judgment, should it nonetheless order a stay of execution? Now, the judge helpfully set out a number of factors to consider when addressing these questions that are a useful checklist to consider when faced with this scenario. First of all, the court will look at whether the adjudicated dispute is one in respect of the whole of the party's financial dealings under the construction contract. The judge stated that smash and grab adjudications were rarely, if ever, going to be enforceable by summary judgment by a company in liquidation. Final account disputes, on the other hand, will potentially give rise to a right to summary judgment, subject to the other factors which I will mention. Second, whether there are mutual dealings between the parties outside the construction contract in question. If there are, then these will be taken into account by the court at the summary judgment stage. Next, whether there are other defences which were not deployed in the adjudication, although the judge did recognise this might be a different way of saying the same thing at point two. Uh, next is whether the liquidator is prepared to offer appropriate undertakings. Now, there are two sorts of undertakings that might be necessary. Firstly, undertakings to protect the money paid pursuant to the summary judgment in a satisfactory way until the outstanding issues are resolved. And secondly, to cover off any adverse costs. Uh, so the liquidator might, for example, undertake to ring fence the proceeds and they might obtain after the event's insurance uh, to deal with any potential adverse costs liability. Lastly, whether there is a real risk that some reinforcement of the decision would deprive the paying party of security for its cross-claim, 
Again, the judge recognised that this might be a different way of saying the same thing as in point four. So drawing all of these threads together, the circumstances in which the court would allow a company in solvent liquidation to enforce an adjudicated award by way of summary judgment are as follows. The adjudicated decision has to resolve or take into account all of the different elements of the overall financial dispute. Mutual dealings, if not already addressed by the adjudicator, have to be taken into account as part of the summary judgment application. And there must be no real risk that the summary enforcement of the adjudicated decision will deprive the paying party of security for their cross claim, i.e. there must be a way of them getting the money back again if it turns out there is a legitimate cross claim which requires payments to them. Now, in this particular case, the liquidator hadn't offered any undertakings. There was a letter of intent from the bank to issue a letter of credit, but the court wasn't happy with the terms on which it was based. And there was also an after event insurance policy offered, but it was argued that that would not provide adequate security because there were a number of material exclusions and avoidance clauses in it, which meant that the court decided it wasn't acceptable for this particular function. There was therefore a real risk that if summary judgment was granted, Aerith would not have security for its claim. The application for summary judgment was therefore refused. Uh, and as a last point on this one, the court concluded by commenting on the timing of the application. As I mentioned, this was quite a long drawn out process um, and the route for claiming summary judgment in respect of the adjudicated decisions has been expedited um, so that it's quick and speedy. In this case, over two years had elapsed since the adjudicated decision was given, uh, and the court found that that was leaving it too long to expect to be able to rely on the expedited process. There was nothing to prevent the party from applying for summary judgment in the usual way, but parties to historic claims such as this were told that they should not expect the court to routinely expedite those applications. Uh, there's a further helpful comment here from Mr Justice Fraser in relation to the ability of liquidators to pursue claims through adjudication. It serves as a reminder that just because one party to the contract is in liquidation, it does not mean its liquidator is unable to pursue claims through adjudication in appropriate circumstances. Uh, and so for those of you who might face claims from liquidators and think that you might be entitled to a windfall, um, here is Mr Justice Fraser saying that that is not going to be the case. So what advice can be distilled from both the Bresco and the Aerith claims for those faced with claims by companies in liquidation? Well, firstly, it's no longer safe to assume that a liquidator won't adjudicate just because there's a cross claim or that the adjudicated decision won't be enforced by the court. Um, liquidators are still gonna have an uphill struggle to persuade the court to grant summary judgment and not to stay the enforcement of the, the uh, judgment. Uh, but these cases make clear that there will be circumstances in which the court will allow it if appropriate. Don't ignore the adjudication process if you're being pursued by a liquidator. The liquidator might not actually seek to enforce the decision by way of summary judgment, but they might use it to assess the value of the claim as part of the process in calculating the net balance in the insolvency and as part of that proving process. If the adjudication doesn't go your way and the liquidator makes an application for summary judgment, then be prepared to challenge enforcement of the decision at the summary judgment stage, if appropriate, by relying on those factors set out above, by arguing that there's inadequate security in respect of any cross claim. So that concludes my run through of our cases. I hope that you found that useful. Um, my contact details are there if you want to contact me about anything, um, but we now have a, an opportunity for a few questions. Um, so, Kerry, if you're still uh, on the call, if you could uh, stop sharing my screen for me and we'll have a look and see if there is anything that anybody has added there. But otherwise, that concludes our session for today. Um, I hope that it won't be too long before we are able to get together again in person and enjoy a bacon sandwich. Uh, but in the meantime, I'd like to wish you and your families a very safe and happy Christmas. Um, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you very much.